Great. Well, we have a uh, jam-packed agenda for you today, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, as always, this webinar is going to be recorded and posted on our website after the blog or after the webinar in a blog format. Um, so please look out for that. You'll also get an email after the webinar uh, of this recording, uh, so you will receive that shortly after. Um, we're very excited here today to be able to present three really great guest speakers and also provide you with an update on some of the things that we're seeing both in policy world as well as uh, in the marketplace regarding opportunity zones. Um, you know, especially when it comes to operating businesses, this is a webinar that I've been really looking forward to presenting. There's been, of course, a lot of discussion about how opportunities and investments can be used to support real estate. And um, we're seeing an emerging marketplace of new investments into operating businesses. And so we have what I would consider some real experts on the webinar here today. And we hope this is gonna be a really great resource for everyone as you look forward in trying to uh, launch new initiatives or structure investments. Um, that is why we have, uh, first of all, Corb Maxwell from Polsonelli. He's back with us to share some investment structures. Jay Bacchus from Corey Innovation Fund. Uh, Corey Innovation Fund has made a number of investments into operating businesses and really interestingly into operating businesses in rural communities. And so really looking forward to his presentation and Andre Folks from Memphis. He uh, runs an accelerator called StartCo and he's gonna share some really great information about an uh, initiative in Memphis called Union Row, but then also how the accelerator is working through partnership to um, expand opportunities for entrepreneurs within that place-based initiative. Um, we should go through the agenda really quickly. So Catherine and I are gonna kick it off. Uh, again, like I mentioned, we're gonna talk about some policy and market updates. Um, again, we're gonna talk about, uh, kick it over to Paul Sinelli to talk about investing in operating businesses, trends and models strategies for investing in rural operating businesses, that's gonna be Corey Innovation Fund, and then how accelerators can partner on revitalization efforts. Um, that is gonna be Starco with Andre. There's gonna be a portion for Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions, just enter in the chat box during the webinar and also during the Q&A portion. And we're also gonna share, like we always do, some Opportunity Zones resources uh, for you guys to take a look at in case those are helpful. Next slide. From here, I'll kick it over to my colleague, Catherine Hyde, or Lyons, sorry. <laughs> That's okay, thanks, Rachel. Um, great, so we'll go over uh, just a little bit of, uh, or some brief updates, I should say, um, you know, from the last few months or so um, related to opportunity zones in the marketplace. Um, so, you know, there's really been uh, quite an uptick in market activity um, in the last uh, uh, six months or so, um, much of it kind of attributed to the fact that we had final regulations uh, delivered by IRS and Treasury um, at the end of last year. And that provided some much needed clarity um, for both communities and investors uh, who were looking to enter the marketplace and make these the, make these investments um, in, uh, into opportunity zones and qualifying projects. Um, so uh, that was a, a real kind of big uh, big lift um, for many stakeholders, um, and we we finally got that um, that final clarity at the end of last year. Um, additionally, at the end of last year, there was the expiration of the the seven year tax benefit. Um, you know, uh, so kind of counting backwards from the 2026 deadline, um, you know, uh, investors would have had to kind of make their first investments and deploy their capital by the end of last year um, into projects in order to, to receive that 15% um, that step up in basis. Um, and so kind of a culmination of those two things led to uh, quite an uptick in, in market activity um, towards the end of last year, but that really continued in the first quarter of this year as well. Um, you know, we see that uh, Novogratic, uh, who of course is a, a kind of an accounting firm, um, very active in the OC marketplace and um, has a opportunity zone fund directory of um, hundreds of funds that they survey on a regular basis uh, in order to get a sense of, at least from that cross section of the market, um, how much money has been raised uh, for deployment into opportunity zones. Um, you can see here that as of their last uh, survey update in April of this year, um, more than 10 billion had been raised. Um, and again, that's just a cross section of the market that they have access to through their opportunity fund listing as well. So um, it's likely, um, you know, several times over that, that amount. 
Um, you know, of course, there's been uh, quite a hiccup in the economy as a whole um, with this uh, with this global pandemic, um, and it certainly caused uh, you know a great deal of economic uncertainty and disruption into the market. Um, but I uh, encourage everyone to take a look at the survey that we did um, uh, back in late May, um, early June, um, to try to capture some of the sentiments around um, around that. And I believe. Perhaps Rachel will go into that in a little more detail as well, but we'll follow up with more information on that as um, too. We were really eager to get a sense of how the market has shifted, um, you know, because of this uh, of the pandemic and the resulting um, economic disruption and uncertainty. Um, and I think there were some really interesting findings there that um, I think position really opportunity zones as a as a tool for the recovery um, because of its emphasis on long term and patient capital. Um, so you'll see the last piece on this is the regulatory relief and guidance that was released by IRS on June 4th um, in the wake of COVID-19. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, there are more details on what IRS provided there here. Um, so IRS essentially wanted to provide some additional flexibility with the understanding that um, a lot of the normal activities um, of investors and fund managers in order to move a project forward have um, been halted. Uh, you know, the due diligence, the traveling to conduct such due diligence, um, the, you know, city council meetings or other meetings that uh, need to be held in order for um, a project to move forward in many cases are, are simply put on hold. Um, and so uh, IRS put out some really helpful uh, guidance on um, you know, that essentially allowed um, projects to, you know, continue to move forward or have additional time um, to move forward. So such delays wouldn't, uh, you know, cause them, um, you know, uh, you know, additional harm, essentially. And so um, there's been, th these list out a few of the uh, kind of the, the main um, items that IRS uh, outlined in their guidance. Um, essentially, you know, taxpayers who need to invest into a qualified opportunity fund now have more time to do so. Um, you know, uh, opportunity funds uh, that may fail the 90% investment test that's required of all opportunity funds um, within a, a certain period through uh, April 1st to the end of the year automatically have reasonable cause um, as to why, why they may not have met that test. Um, you know, for, for those investments undergoing the substantial improvement period, essentially any months between April and December won't count towards that 30 month um, period. Uh, just again, given the kind of level of disruption, um, especially construction and other industries. Um, and uh, there was also clarity that, um, you know, there, uh, this is essentially a federally declared disaster um, for which the regulations provide some additional flexibility with regards to the working capital safe harbor and other areas. Um, and so um, it was clarified that, uh, that this pandemic does indeed constitute that. Um, and so that, um, that additional flexibility is apl applicable across the board. Um, so that was very helpful guidance. And again, uh, in, uh, in hopes of mitigating any of the negative impacts, um, you know, or, or at least some of the negative impacts of this uh, disruption on the OZ market, um, you know, as the year continues. Um, so I think with that, I will turn it back over to Rachel uh, to take us from there. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine Lyons. <laughs> Sorry, I messed up your last name. Um, so Catherine did mention uh, the Opportunity Zones survey that we did, um, I guess a few months ago now at this point. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention, just because it's a question that comes up so often, is how, are, how has the pandemic impacted investor behavior? Um, one of the points that Catherine just made is that the IRS has provided some additional flexibility for when uh, investors can invest into opportunity funds. And um, what we're likely to see is probably a continuation of what uh, the reaction with the survey that we saw around investor behavior being that prospective investors will remain interested even if they're currently hesitate, hesitant to commit. And so. 71% um, of respondents indicated that that was true when we surveyed them in May. I'd imagine that that remains to be the case, um, and you may see more of a ramp up in investment towards the latter part of the year. However, we do know, based on the news clips that we get daily, that investments are still being made, and so it's a real reason to stay, stay in the game, stay in the marketplace, and continue to engage with investors. Um, that's all I'll say on this slide. There's a link there to our National Opportunity Zone survey. Um, and if you want to just run over and check it out now, uh, it's on our website under a blog post. Next slide. Yeah, and as I mentioned, uh, all of these news clips, this is a lot of text on one slide. I have one more for you, but I think it's really demonstrative of the activity that has occurred 
since the final regulations um, were, were offered. And also these are recent news clips. And so there really is activity that continues to happen. We're seeing um, really great strategies around investments being made uh, into portfolio companies that accelerators have, have launched or are incubating. Um, we're seeing that there in Warren, Ohio, where there were just two investments through Bright Energy Innovators, their, um, their accelerator that they have there. Um, we're also seeing investments being made directly into co-working space operators. Um, we've mentioned proximity space out in Montrose, Colorado before. Uh, here we have Launchpad, which is a great co-working space. Uh, they just recently received an investment from Caliber, but then they're also moving into a piece of real estate owned by Caliber, which Caliber is investing in to renovate and it's part of a broader downtown revitalization effort in Mesa. Um, I won't go through all of these, but uh, just wanted to point out this really interesting model there in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, where they're working with activated capital. Uh, so, uh, you know, third party fund manager, but there is a targeted effort to raise a $25 million fund to support both real estate and business in Coatesville. Next slide. Yeah, and similarly here, I just wanted to highlight a few things. Again, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, we're seeing uh, a fund commit money uh, through an accelerator, an energy innovation center there in Pittsburgh. And they're sort of using that as their foundation to source new businesses, uh, create a pipeline of investable opportunities. But that's a tactic that we've seen in a number of places. Um, you know, they're in Provo, Utah as well with Hall Venture Partners. Um, we're also seeing local residents come to the table and make investments. One of my favorite stories is the one in Brookville, Indiana, where the local family sold their, uh, their company and then they invested gains in a number of different activities. But one of those activities was to acquire the town's local newspaper, which is one of the oldest newspapers in the state. Um, to help provide working capital to, um, to reinvest and reinvigorate the, the business. And then in Tucson, Arizona, this is a, a new story that I was really excited to touch base with the founder a few weeks ago, but it's the Women's Innovation Fund Accelerator and it's a women and minority owned accelerator and they are strictly focused on investing in gender balanced companies and also providing those companies with the tools that they need to, um, to think about sustainability. So sustainability in your uh, supply chain logistics, sustainability in the products that you produce. And so um, that's another really great example of how folks are marrying both opportunity zone investment, as well as this sort of um, platform as far as an accelerator and incubator model in order to both ramp up new businesses and then attract the private investment needed to, to help them grow. Next slide. And with that, I'm super excited to turn it over to Core Maxwell from Polsonelli. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate it. And thank you to everybody at EIG. Um, is my sound coming through okay for everybody? Yes, it is. Take that as yes. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and thanks to everybody at EIG for putting together this forum. This is uh, one that I've participated in approximately a year ago and I'm happy to be doing it again because I think it really is one of the most critical um, items that we're all trying to address in the OZ world and that is extending OZs and making sure the promise of the legislation doesn't just end up in more sticks and bricks built across the country. While sticks and bricks are important um, and near and dear to my heart as a real estate lawyer, um, really the focus that we've had at Polsonelli, a big focus that we've had beyond the sticks and bricks side, and I think all of us in the OZ ecosystem is how do we make sure that we are taking the promise of this law and moving it into operating companies? And that's really been a goal that we've had as a firm for the last two and a half years. And um, one of the reasons that we've been uh, so excited about our participation in EIG as they continue to push that concept out to the market and um, the number of entrepreneurs we run into and folks with great ideas and um, things that are, could be transformative for, the, for their communities in America are vast and, and trying to unlock the promise of OZs to them. So um, as always, incredibly excited to be part of this panel and 
uh, and supportive of all of the work that EIG does, both as our public policy arm for, for OZs, but also as sort of the convener and leader of this OZ ecosystem. Um, next slide, please. So before I go in and talk through um, structures that we're using sort of on a daily basis talking to, uh, talking to clients, I wanted to first do a little bit about um, where, we, where we come from or where we come to uh, this discussion with. And we have been in the OZ space now for two and a half years, I think, as a whole, um, since we, the legislation was approved and been working with the IG. And we come to the point where today we sit at 100 closed transactions. So um, between real estate, between multi-asset fund vehicles, between operating companies, and then uh, in advising family offices and high net worth individuals and going into real estate or operating company deals or funds, we've closed about 100 deals. And as anybody in this space knows, to close 100 deals, you have to work on many, many, many more um, to get to that point. Um, but uh, I think like most would say across the, the ecosystem and environment, still the vast majority of our transactions continue to be in the real estate space. Of those 100 closed deals, I was um, adding it up to, to get ready for this. And I think probably 15 some odd percent have been true, pure operating company deals that don't have um, a real estate aspect to them in some form or fashion. And while that percentage is still um, lower than I would like, uh, we do see good green shoots that the, uh, it is expanding. Um, the real estate deals are still moving forward and coming, um, uh, coming maybe not fast and furious as they were before COVID, but they're still moving forward. But um, daily, we seem to be making progress in the operating company space. And again, that is um, where we think uh, the greatest focus has to continue to be as we want to uh, grow the full promise of this law. Next slide, please. So before I go in and start talking about um, uh, structures, I figured it would be useful to do a little bit of just what are we seeing kind of on the ground. And I think all of this um, maybe isn't exactly um, what Rachel and Catherine are seeing, but it, it sort of rhymes. Um, and I was just going to provide a little bit of that perspective before we then move into specifically talking about the structures and hopefully it sets up some of the discussion also from the other panelists as well. So um, as I kind of said before, we've done 100 deals, you know, roughly 15 of them have been pure opco deals, so less than 15%. And kind of why is that? Um, I think it's just generally in the fact that given the law we're looking at, given it what we're doing, it is harder to do operating company deals than real estate. In my own mind, I put that in a couple of different, for a couple of different reasons. First, um, from all my years of being a real estate development lawyer, one of the things that um, real estate developers do really well is they know how to access and use incentivized capital in the capital stack. So they were naturally predisposed to this and ready to start working on it almost immediately. So I think real estate got a big bump from that, that your, your average real estate developer is used to and works with state level programs like this and municipal level programs like this and have done so their whole career. So bringing about a federal program um, was only something that they, they uh, dove into early and started working on early. But beyond just that kind of natural predisposition, the, the pieces that I always bring up of why are OPCO deals harder um, they're harder for just two real fundamental reasons. First, this whole incentive is about a geographic area. It's about depressed locations or areas that have been left behind economically and that we want to spur um, uh, advancement and development in. And so it's based around census tracts. And that geographic basing makes it much easier to do real estate deals because one, the real estate deal never gets up and moves. Um, and it's there for the long term, but two, it's also incredibly easy to indicate or locate where that business is. There is no other place that it can be except in that zone, and um, that's just the opposite, right, for operating companies. Operating companies always have the ability to move, and 
um, it, it takes a lot of work to realize and understand where is a building or where is a business located. Um, luckily, with all of the good work that EIG did over the last two years um, with Treasury, with the IRS, with congressional leadership, we really got to a place when all the final regs um, came down that we now know and can locate these operating company businesses and the rules work um, to make this work. So we have set up the regulatory framework to conquer that sort of geographic question, um, but now it's just getting the deals done. I think the other uh, sort of hurdle that we've had, which was absolutely the design of the legislation and where we were headed was we wanted long-term investment. We didn't want hot money coming in and out of uh, these areas. We wanted to incent long-term investment. And um, while a 10-year time horizon is uh, difficult for real estate deals, it is, um, it, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Your normal fund would have a seven or eight year life, all things considered, if, if OZs weren't involved. So extending that to two, three, four more years um, wasn't that big of a stretch. Um, I think that just the general VC, PE, or other investor telling folks that they need to go in for a 10-year period of time has um, proven more difficult as a lot of them are not immediately predisposed for those long, long um, lived investments. But um, we're working through that. All of us in the community are working through that. Um, and encouraging these investors to come into these funds and come into these businesses because uh, that is where the ultimate greatest return is going to be seen. The greatest um, multiple of invested capital uh, in a deal is for long-term investments in operating businesses that are compounding wealth at a higher level. So all of that's to say that the regulatory framework is there. It's still harder to do operating company deals, but the regulatory framework is there. And from that, and I think we're gonna hear from some today, the funds and businesses are out there and ready for the capital. Um, they just need the investors and the capital to come forward in this to start making the investments. And the interesting part of that is what we've really seen is from all of the, the great things that happened with the IRS and regulatory flexibility that Rachel and Catherine went through, it really has been a double-edged sword. And why do I say that? This um, uh, flexibility has been incredibly helpful to individual investors out there. They now have longer time periods to invest their gain. We're still talking about the ability to invest 2019 gains that could have even been from the very beginning of 2019 to be able to invest them into funds all the way towards the end of 2020. It's pretty amazing um, the, the, the flexibility that IRS Treasury gave us and the ability uh, EIG had to, to, to work towards those, those goals. But it comes at uh, a price. And that price is those investors today truly um, are not under uh, the gun to make that investment. They have towards till the end of the year. And we really got into a place in the market that I would see where the rush of investment from investors was happening on every six months. As we came up to a June 30th deadline, we would receive, you know, maybe 75 to 80% of the investment that we were collecting for funds or businesses or deals were happening in the last one to two to three weeks uh, of a uh, of a six month period when testing dates were coming up, and this flexibility has really made us lose one of those six month components where I think we would have seen a lot more investment on June thirtieth, and it's really pressed us out to the end of the year. So uh, it, it's been incredibly pro taxpayer, pro investor, pro fund that we've all had more time to do it, but it really has taken out some of the the anxiousness that we would see of investors when they were coming up against deadlines. But I think all of us are excited as December 31st comes um, uh, closer and closer that we will see uh, a really large, large, uh, large round of investment that rolls back into um, the OZ ecosystem. And then generally, I would make one other comment to say what we're seeing, not just in the OZ space, but I'm seeing all across 
law firm clients and all across the market. And that's just um, a disconnect in the market based on COVID. Uh, the seller of assets um, wants to sell at the price of where they were six months ago. That could be real estate, that could be an operating business, that could be equipment, um, that could be any form of, uh, of asset to get a capital gain to it, while the buyer wants a COVID discount that could be um, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% or more. And so there's just this very, very large disconnect that has generally slowed down transactions all across the market. Again, that's not OZ specific. That is um, something we're seeing in just regular real estate deals, regular M&A deals, private equity and otherwise, that this disconnect that COVID has created is something all of us are having to work through uh, to get back to a functioning uh, market. So with that, what are we seeing? What are we seeing as a firm kind of anecdotally out there? We're continuing to see um, uh, singular investments or entrepreneurs. So you have a high net worth individual that had a gain, um, had an event, um, uh, uh, had a liquidity moment in their life in 2019 or 2020, somewhere in there. And then they're going and they've got their next deal, their next, um, uh, their next uh, real estate deal, their next entrepreneurial deal that they've got, and they're investing their own gains and their own deal and moving forward. Um, to me, this really feels like what we were doing in 2018 for real estate. Um, in 2018 for real estate, before we had any guidance, before we knew everything what the law meant, um, we would still have entrepreneurial sort of developer types that were willing to take their gains and invest them into um, their specific real estate deals. We did um, any number of those types of deals with, with heavy caveats, obviously, to them, but we did a lot of those. And I see that same sort of component seems to be happening in the operating company space right now where we're advising folks that are, that are looking at targets and looking at acquisitions um, where they're looking at investing their own gains into it. We're also continuing to see a lot of smaller fund investments and portfolio investments from uh, those funds that folks are getting in those maybe sub $1 million checks from investors and then they're going and deploying those in portfolio investments. And Catherine uh, or Rachel went through a bunch of those of things that we're seeing in the paper and then things that don't make the paper that we're working on daily we're running into a lot of those types of deals and that's excellent because all of those are sort of uh, uh, creating the muscle memory for us as we start working towards bigger and bigger deals. And then we continue to be in a place where we're having conversations and planning about larger and larger investments. Um, and you know, my true hope in this is uh, not because this is only the province of large deals and big deals, but I think those big deals really start to capture the imagination and also create all of us in the infrastructure, give us sort of the playbooks of how do we start executing on smaller deals is my hope is that we truly see a large catalyzing investment that receives a substantial amount of press and play. Um, you know, maybe this is in tech, maybe it's a seed, maybe it's a series A round or something like that. And we have a really, really large check size, something in the 25 to $100 million range of a raise happening, having it all be OZ based um, and showing a great, great, great success story. If we could get one to two of those types, I think that will be enough that it really starts opening investors' eyes and opening the PE, VC, and others' communities um, into making larger and larger OZ investments. And for those on the entrepreneurial or capital raising side, to be able to see that OZs is a viable strategy for them to be able to do their Series A, Series B, and larger rounds of investment. So um, a lot of that's just anecdotal and my thoughts, but it's, it's what we're seeing as we continue to work in this space every single day. Next slide. So with that, I'll really try to, to, to rush and, and do more what um, Rachel and Catherine instructed me is to set up the structures that we use and see every day to then set up Andre and Jay for their talks about 
what it, what does deal structure look like? So the first one that I've done here is just a stand, what we call standard deal structure. This could be an operating company or a real estate deal, but it is your standard two tier structure um, where almost every conversation seems it starts in OZ. So in the upper sort of uh, left hand side of the slide, you have your QOF and your QOF of course has a sponsor that comes in and then fund investors, those fund investors that are bringing in capital gains and the sponsor that's also bringing in capital gains mm -hmm. Um, and or just has a profits interest or a carried interest in the QOF. That QOF then invests into the QOZB, the Qualified Opportunity Zone business. Again, this could be an operating or a real estate deal. Um, and that QOZB then owns QOZB property. That property could be real estate, it could be a lease of real estate, um, or it could be business property out there. And then to the side, what I've shown in the kind of lime green is that the JV partner could come in and that JV partner could be another OZ fund. Oftentimes when we have a good investment, what we'll see is many of the funds want to come into that um, excellent QOZB there. So you could have another OZ fund that comes in or it could be sort of what we air quote a fresh equity investor, just a uh, regular um, investor that does not have capital gain. The lender could then come in at the QOZB level or they could come in down below at the QOZB property level. And then, um, you know, just the province of most managers, they're always interested in sort of the fees. Um, and we walk through all of the different uh, fees that could happen at the QOZB level. Next slide, please. So um, this is a slide that I always like to um, provide when, when presenting on this because so often, and you can even hear it in my comments, um, we're talking about you know, large funds and large investments and large deals and trying to put in you know, 10 million of equity or 25 million of equity or 100 million of equity into you know, really large complex deals. And oftentimes I think that is off-putting um, to you know, individuals or entrepreneurs or a small real estate developer or otherwise that they get this name and this word fund and uh, they sort of freeze up. They think that's um, something way beyond them and what they're doing or what they're up to. And we always like to show them that, yes, the law talks about funds and, and all of this is around funds, but it doesn't have to be a Wall Street based vehicle. It really can be something where folks can take in, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 or, uh, or less that they can set up their own fund and their own qualified opportunity zone business and move on this. It takes a little bit of structuring because of, uh, we need these entities to be uh, regarded entities, meaning that if they're a partnership based that they need to have two partners. Um, or that they need to be a C or an S corp and, and recognized as sort of regarded entities. But uh, an individual investor, an individual entrepreneur with an idea and with some gains can go and create their own structure and execute their own OZ deals uh, in a manner like we've described here. Next slide, please. So this is just sort of now really taking this to the next level of some of the points we made on the standard slide and taking this specifically just for your operating business. And I really call this sort of the startup slide, which is really always the easiest world with the less, the least complex um, operating company questions that come into, uh, into them. But you've got a service provider, or your idea person that has an idea for a business. This is your classic entrepreneur. And they want to start this business and they want to start it in an OZ. Well, what they need to do is go out and either they can create an OZ fund where they could go in and be a sponsor in that OZ fund and attract capital to it, or just find another um, operating OZ fund out there. And then those two come together, both the OZ fund and this service provider idea person, and they create a QOZB, start this new bid business that's going to create these widgets um, in an OZ um, and, you know, get 
enough QOZB properties so that they meet the 70% tangible asset test and then also with their employees and otherwise, they meet the 50% gross income test. What we most often see for the QOZB property of one of these startups um, or most operating businesses is the incredibly favorable lease guidance that IRS and Treasury and EIG worked for that the main piece of QOZB property that you'll have is the lease of this business of a space in um, an Opportunity Zone census tract. That's usually the core component of the tangible property and the thing that tips the test um, uh, towards that you have enough good assets for the business. But this is just our very simple sort of um, uh, structure chart here. One other part that I should make, and, and we'll make this point a few times through here, is that this idea person, they can of course invest capital gains if they have them um, into the fund or into the QOZB. And we always, always try to encourage that entrepreneur or that service provider to do that. That can often be tough. Um, a lot of times the very reason they're out raising money is that they do not have large capital gains or liquid assets, but we're always trying to work through that component. If they don't have any form of gains, then we can just set everything up as a profits interest in this um, for, for, for them receiving uh, their remuneration in this. So we, we can do that, that it's just a profits interest that would get capital gains tax treatment if it meets the, the hold periods and otherwise. Um, but if we can, we're always trying to have that uh, idea person or entrepreneur uh, make a capital gain investment. Next slide. So this is probably more where the, the harder questions start and, and where I think myself and my tax partners probably spend the most time and most calls when it comes to operating companies is they already have a, a good operating business. It's making money. It's doing well. Um, and they're located in an opportunity zone or they're thinking about moving to an opportunity zone. And they ask the question, well, how do I make this work for them? Um, and this slide tries to start that process of going through it and walking folks through how it would work. First, sort of the point we always have to make at the, at the outset is that the opportunity zones do not benefit the current equity investors and their current equity today. It may have benefited them by their getting sort of an uptick for their equity or they're able to uh, more easily attract this OZ fund or these new investors to the deal. Um, but we really are looking at uh, bringing in uh, a, a, an OZ fund to make an investment in them and or creating an OZ fund and having their current investors and new investors invest down into the business. But the key component of this is, and it's sort of um, referenced by this like colloquial good asset store we've created over here, is that this expansion or extension of the business of this new equity, this new OZ equity coming down into the QOZB is then going over to this good asset store. And what does that mean? It means that we're buying new assets or we're leasing new assets or we're finding new assets um, that uh, are new after 2017. We're bringing them into the business so that this business can have 70% good assets and end up passing the tangible property tests that we have to. Those old assets of the business um, need to be below 30% and we need to go to this good asset store and create a new 70% in here to make it work for uh, the existing business. So it doesn't work well for a business that's just in a static state, but for a business that's expanding and growing and needs new um, investors and investments so that it can continue to grow, we can make this work all day long and have done it many, many times. Moving on to the next slide. So the next slide that we've done is looking, um, you know, the, the previous one, I basically said it didn't work for the old equity, right? It it's, it's really was a benefit for the new equity. This is kind of a thought of how do we make this structure and how can we make a structure work that benefits um, all of the equity in this process. And it really comes from the fact of 
Uh, this, this isn't a startup, but it has to be relatively early stage and or it has to be incredibly asset light. Um, it's, it's best if really the only asset is intellectual property, but if we also have a relatively low basis um, in current assets, then we can end up organizing a structure where the current LLC um, it ends up selling into the new uh, QOZB, and then we have the old investors and the new investors come in um, to the fund and be able to make this work and benefit. Um, a couple of different points here. One, first, um, this is really set up for that there's going to be a, a less than 20% relation between the new investors and the old investors. And the reason for that, or sorry, this is more than 20% related and more than 20% related, um, the way that we're making it qualify is all of the old assets that we're bringing in are bad assets, but we're making them qualify uh, because there would be less than 30% of the asset base. So even though that there's relation between the investors, um, it doesn't penalize us. We just end up needing to, to uh, ex uh, expand um, our asset base to, to get it to work. I didn't do a slide, but this all is, is frankly easier if it's less than 20% related. If we're less than 20% related, then the sale between the current company and the new co um, it, it really doesn't matter because of that less than 20% relation. The new assets that are coming in uh, don't necessarily have to be bad assets, so it all works better. Um, one component we do have to watch out for in all of this, though, is uh, I think the biggest surprise of the final regs that we got in December, and that was sort of the circular or step transaction doctrine that was applied of not allowing in a situation, even when there is less than 20% relation, um, that the old investors or the old company, when it sells and any gain that they have, that they are not allowed to invest those into the new OZ fund and into the new co. Um, that has been a substantial hiccup for many of our clients and many of the deals of investors that come forward to us that they want to structure transactions like that and they want to quote unquote roll their gain into the deal and get opportunity zone treatment. And unfortunately that was foreclosed to us all um, through the final regulations. Um, next slide please. And I'll try to finish up. I'm sure I probably went over time and I apologize for that. This last one I, I give um, and I gave it in the last presentation and it generated a lot of questions and a lot of interest from tax exempt organizations. And I say it every time, I say this is still in my mind more theory than practice. Um, this is not actually something that I can point to and show how we've deployed it, how we've made it work, how this has worked for um, a large tax exempt organization but it is something I've had innumerable amount of discussions on across the country um, with all different types of small 501c3s or tax exempts all the way to very, very large um, hospitals and universities and otherwise. And it's the idea of can those organizations use OZs to extend their balance sheet? And we wrote up some notes on this, but the very, very short answer of what we have worked through on, on a, um, any variety of deals, and it really does take a special institution and a special investment to make this work. Um, but if you have a tax exempt organization that has sort of tapped its normal donor base and, and has all of the charitable contributions it can get from that normal donor base, and it's also maybe ex, uh, tapped its debt base out there, um, but it does still think that it's got some donors that might not be willing to make a pure charitable donation, but they would be willing to make a impact investment um, with them. You know, they want the money back, but they in essence want it back at an incredibly low interest rate, one, two, three percent. And that all sounds um, bizarre that I'm talking in the terms of interest rates and debt right? Because all of us who work in OZs know that it's all about equity investments. But the way I've found to best explain it 
um, to tax exempt organizations and those looking at this is if you can come up with incredibly favorable debt terms, you know, um, that basically it's a balloon paid back at the end of 10 years at a 1% rate. If you have that type of donor that won't give you any more charitable, uh, charitable contributions, but they would give you the use of their money to support the mission at a very, very, very um, favorable rate, then we could look through and use OZs so that that investor still gets somewhat um, uh, of, a, uh, of a heightened benefit through the tax law, that they may be more willing to make that impact investment and we can set up a deal under those structures. So again, more theory than practice, but I know given the audience um, that is often on these calls, we've found a lot of interest in this um, and have been helping sort of organizations think through these items all across the country. Um, with that, I, I know I probably ran over my time and I apologize um, very much to the other panelists, but I'll turn it back over to Rachel and Catherine and, and let them um, introduce the other panelists. Yeah, thank you so much, Corb. And just want to acknowledge we're getting, you know, quite a few questions, both in the chat box as well as Q&A. For questions that we don't get to during the Q&A portion, we'll try our best to address after the webinar and um, address that in the blog post. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jay Bacchus from Core Innovation Fund. Thank you, Rachel. Um, my name is Jay Bockhouse. I'm the managing partner of the Center on Rural Innovations Seed Fund, the Cori Innovation Fund. Um, I want to give an overview today of Cori and, and the work that our fund has been doing investing in startup businesses in, in opportunity zones. But first, just a thanks to, uh, to Corb for a great overview of the, the market trends um, and also the structures. That's super helpful and, and, and interesting. Next slide, please. Uh, I think we skipped one, or maybe it's one one down. There we go. Um, so when when someone talks about rural, uh, what what do you think of? Many people think of red barns, cornfields, uh, an older population. Um, what, what if I was to tell you that there's an amazing group of entrepreneurs creating innovative businesses in small rural towns across the country? We, we found some really intriguing um, startups growing in opportunity zones in rural America, uh, including the business you see here, Agile Space Industries. Um, Agile is one of the only independent rocket testing facilities in the United States, um, and they're using brand new 3D printing technology to manufacture uh, their very own space propulsion systems, and, and they're doing this out of their headquarters in an opportunity zone uh, out in Durango, Colorado, which is a town of about 20,000. Um, I'll tell you more about them uh, later on. You can skip back up to the previous slide. So, so let me give you a, an overview of Cori. Um, the Center on Rural Innovation, it's a, it's a national nonprofit action tank um, advancing economic prosperity uh, in, in rural America. Uh, Cori's activities include supporting a nationwide network of, of rural tech hubs through um, an initiative called the Rural Innovation Initiative. Um, Cori uses its mapping tools and analytics to provide better data for, for rural decision makers. Um, Corey's helping close the digital divide by, by advancing broadband issues. And uh, we're also facilitating access to capital uh, to underserved rural entrepreneurs. And, and that's where um, my effort with the Corey Innovation Fund comes in. So the Corey Innovation Fund, we launched this at the end of last year um, to support tech enabled businesses in rural opportunity zones um, and increase entrepreneurial equity in America. The, the fund raised outside capital um, and is structured as a qualified opportunity fund. And we're working to find and invest in great operating tech businesses in, in rural opportunity zones. And, and we've made a lot of progress to date that I'll, that I'll share with you. So two slides down, please. So Corey was founded um, to address the gap in opportunity between metro and rural areas that formed in our country after the Great Recession. Uh, employment all across America took a major hit in 2009. Um, metro areas largely recovered, um, rural areas largely did not. Um, there, there are many reasons for this, um, but some of the major ones include automation and, and offshoring of some traditional rural industries. So, so metro areas have been benefiting from increased technology jobs and service sector jobs uh, where many rural areas have not. 
Um, the impact of COVID has been pretty severe across the board and, and may cause further issues, but that's still uh, TBD on the impact. So we'll be tracking that over time. Next slide, please. So th there are some important market trends providing tailwinds for, for rural economies. Um, the lifestyle and cost advantages of rural areas compared to metro areas are, are better than ever. Uh, if you look at a survey of where people actually want to live uh, versus where they live today, the plurality of Americans want to live in rural areas. So 27% would like to be in rural, um, you know, versus the 15% the that live there today. The, the question is, um, are there job opportunities to, to enable that, that movement? You know, another hot topic uh, that's been really pressing um, due to COVID is access to broadband. So, so quality broadband is a must for the technology businesses that, that we are um, dealing with. There's a lot more work to do in many areas, but, but certain areas of um, America have great broadband uh, in, in rural. So for example, Corey set up a, a tech hub called the Black River Innovation Campus um, located in Springfield, Vermont. And, and Springfield, Vermont has gigabit internet fiber to the home. So some of the fastest internet speeds in the country. Corey's been using um, its data mapping and analytics to identify areas where broadband is enabled and has also been working to increase um, connectivity in areas wh where it's not. So some smaller communities have really made a lot of progress on this front and we're trying to um, in encourage that on a go forward basis. One other potential uh, catalyst in rural is, is opportunity zones. So there are 2,800 uh, rural opportunity zones, which is about one third of the total. And the tax advantage of opportunity zones can, can really help uh, highlight projects in these rural areas. Now, obviously OZ treatment can't make a bad deal into um, a good one, but it can serve to draw attention to these projects and areas and also tip the scales in favor of, of completing transactions. So Corey's trying to serve these rural areas by, by highlighting and, and working with these um, you know, positive trends to catalyze change. Next slide, please. So um, one of the major components of Corey is the Rural Innovation Initiative and, and Corey's enlisted 20 partner communities uh, to be part of this, this um, um, program. These communities stretch from uh, Independence, Oregon, uh, the furthest west, all the way to Waterville, Maine, which is the furthest east. And each community is building a, a tech hub to encourage startup businesses as well as remote working. Um, these hubs have a, a physical space to promote density. They provide um, programming to promote economic growth and, and through Corey work together as a network to share problems and, and best practices all of the rural innovation initiative communities are, are either in or contiguous with with opportunity zones so um, these communities and, and other rural areas have, have been a bit behind when it comes to, to access to capital traditionally if you look uh, historically at, at venture capital in the united states less than one percent of that has um, gone to, to rural areas so we're trying to use the incentives of the opportunity zone program to, to steer investment uh, to some of these rural communities and as the Core Innovation Fund, um, we're providing uh, capital to the best businesses coming out of the Rural Innovation Initiative, uh, as well as some other startups located or willing to relocate to um, rural opportunity zones. Next slide, please. So we've been able to, to use the Corey network um, as, as a deal pipeline to, to, to source um, uh, transactions. We've also used our broader network and are, are open to um, in, in engaging with any business that is either in or willing to relocate to a small community um, opportunity zone. And, and um, you know, when we were formulating the fund last year, we, we weren't entirely sure about what types of businesses we would find in these areas, but we've been really impressed with the great ideas and, and hardworking entrepreneurs uh, we've encountered. In, in addition, we found um, there's been great companies based in other areas that are willing to relocate to small community opportunity zones uh, to be part of the portfolio. To two of the five deals that we've done to date have taken that shape where, where businesses have relocated into uh, rural OZs um, as part of the process. So at, at our um, at initial closing at the end of the last year, since that time, uh, we've invested in, in five highly promising businesses. Um, 
in some cases, we've used the capital to extend uh, the operating runway for the business that became really important for some of them uh, in the middle of COVID. In other situations, startups have agreed to relocate, as I, as I mentioned, uh, to be part of the portfolio. And then in other scenarios, we've allowed businesses to stay uh, in their local communities uh, rather than relocate to, to raise capital. So you often hear of the, the brain drain to the coast. And, and part of that is, is really access to capital and being able to, to access um, both networks and funding sources around that. So we're, we're attempting to use our capital to drive economic and, and job growth um, in these rural opportunity zones. Next slide, please. So I, I want to share some of our, our founder stories with you because they're pretty um, compelling, at least in, in, in my view. Uh, I'll start out with uh, Agile Space Industries. So, so uh, Agile was founded by a guy named Dowdy Barnes. Um, Dowdy used to work on the Space Shuttle Main Engine Project at Rocketdyne in Los Angeles. Um, he is literally a rocket scientist, um, a fascinating guy. So he wanted to raise his family somewhere else. So he moved out to um, Durango, Colorado, and he started a rocket propulsion testing business out of the airport, which happens to be a, an opportunity zone. Um, so through the local community, he met up with a gentleman named Jeff Max, who had a deep experience as an entrepreneur and, and, a, and a CEO. And together, um, they sort of reimagined the business and started using 3D printing technology to make um, proprietary space propulsion systems. So with, with the, the testing facility that they owned um, and the manufacturing being on site, they're able to develop these propulsion systems in, in a fraction of the time that it used to take. It used to be a five to 10 year process uh, to complete from design to implementation of a, of a propulsion system. They're doing it in, in less than a year. So the company has um, a pretty impressive uh, group of clients, including NASA and, and Lockheed Martin, US Air Force. Um, and, and it's employing local engineers. There's a, um, a local university, Fort Lewis College, where they've hired from. And they're also bringing in some really, really impressive talent from, from other areas that are actually um, working and, and accepting offers at, at lower salaries uh, in order to uh, you know, engage with the lifestyle of that, that, that local area. So th this is a great example of, of leading innovation coming out of a, a rural opportunity zone. We invested in their series seed raise alongside some local capital, and, and I'm really excited to see where they take this business. So keep track of that, Agile. Ne next slide, please. Um, and another founder I want to highlight is Show Rust. Show grew up in a town called Cape Girardeau, Missouri. It's on the, the banks of the Mississippi River. Um, in the course of the career, he, he, uh, he became a very um, accomplished designer and, and development person, and he was working as a lead branding designer at BCG, BCG Digital out in Los Angeles. He had an idea for a, an AI-enabled brand management system and, and decided to go back home uh, to build it out of his parents' garage uh, on the cheap. So Sho and his team created this um, pretty impressive living brand system and, and enlisted an uh, interesting set of beta clients. The original expectation that, that show had was to have to go back to LA or New York uh, for capital, but the company was able to, to stay in Cape Girardeau um, with, with our investments. Um, they found a you know, great deal in an office in, in a downtown our, our opportunity zone and, and hired local talent from uh, Southeast Missouri State, which is in Cape Girardeau, um, as well as bringing in some, some very interesting new talent from other parts of the country. Uh, show, show's goal is to become the first big tech startup in, in Cape Toronto. Um, you know, having a business like Show AI uh, create resilient tech jobs is it, fantastic for economic growth um, in, in these smaller opportunity zones. If Show can really scale this business and eventually create a, a substantial exit, it can really be transformative for the local ecosystem. Um, so we're, we're, we're rooting for, for one of these deals to really take off and, and be able to have knock-on benefits uh, in the local area. Uh, we, we funded Cho's Series C round and, and are hoping that, that um, you know, his vision of becoming a, a major tech business can, can come to fruition. So I, I think I did better on, on my time um, than, than Corp. But thanks for letting me provide an overview of, of what we're doing in, in Opportunity Zones. Um, we're, we're excited to, to, to share more uh, as we find these great businesses and um, provide them capital to grow. You're on mute, Rachel. 
and of course I'm on mute. Um, thank you, Jay. Don't go anywhere quite yet because there are some few some questions that I'm going to try to uh, field in real time. So, um, what does it take to be part of the Cory of Cory's uh, Rural Innovation Network? Yeah, so, so Corey runs a, a competitive process each year. Uh, so they, they get applications from, from local communities that would like to be part of the network. The, the first cohort of 10 uh, was launched two years ago. And then this past fall, we added another 10. So that's the, the 20 to date. And there will likely be an, a, another process uh, th th this fall. So um, information on the Corey website is available and, and, and keep an eye out for that next uh, round of applications. Um, we'd, we'd love to interface with those communities. Yeah, and one more question for you. Um, and I think that this leads really well into Andre's uh, presentation, but, and I'm gonna expand it a little bit. First, if you could take this first part. So is VC investment the right kind for rural communities and entrepreneurs? And Andre, maybe you can answer that for just in general. It, does VC work for entrepreneurs? Yeah, so, so I, I think there's been, Traditionally, VC has been a relatively short cycle um, between, you know, fund creation and, and, and fund exit. And there has been, um, I think, a trend within Silicon Valley VC of, of trying to promote companies very rapidly and, and then exit those businesses very quickly. So we, we don't take that approach. Um, you know, these startup businesses need capital. And, and at this stage, we, we call it venture capital. Um, I would say the businesses in the areas where we are operating are able to generate a lot more runway out of the same amount of capital than, than a comparative business um, on, on the coast. So they, they do have, with the same amount of capital, quite a bit of, of time to develop that business. And I'd also say, also say we, we are looking for a long-term hold here. So we, we are not putting pressure on them um, to have sort of that next funding round or, or exit event we would like them to build a, a profitable business with, with great job creation over time. So, so I think in our particular brand of VC, it, it works quite well. Excellent, thanks Jay. And with that, turn it over to Andre and Andre is gonna tell us why VC matters for, for businesses in Memphis. Great, well, uh, thank you, Rachel. And uh, it's great to be here. Thank you to EIG and uh, hosting this uh, convening today. Um, if we can just go ahead to the next slide, I'll hop right in. Um, you know, just wanted to mention some of the partners in this overall effort. Um, Starco is our organization, which I'll spend a little bit of time on. We'll also walk you through the Union Road development, which is positioned in an opportunity zone here in, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, and then also how we're coming together and creating an innovation-driven economic development model, taking advantage of the OZ structure. The City of Memphis is involved, the University of Memphis as a lead academic partner, and the Downtown Memphis Commission as well. Uh, next slide, please. Well, Starco, we're a venture architect company that takes clients and partners through a design process for launching early stage technologies, business innovations, and economic solutions. Next slide. We do this looking through three lenses. Um, one is the digital city. Um, we are building a connected community at the Union Road development where we will have smart city infrastructure um, and then layered on top of that um, entrepreneurial activity to solve problems for public and private partners. And we'll be working through our venture development arm in terms of corporate innovation services to bring best practices and support to those companies. And then also capital, uh, the launching of a venture fund, taking advantage of the OZ structure and also leveraging our other investment partners locally, regionally and nationally. Next slide. Um, basically, we're always trying to do this leaning on best practices across the, the, the realm here. Um, lean methods is something that we pride ourselves in. Rachel mentioned our accelerators earlier. Um, we're very good at running accelerator programs, been doing that over the last decade, but we do it and we cater them to our partners, our corporates that we work with, and uh, other folks who are looking to side up next to startups as a means not just to push startups forward, but also to make introductions and broker them into our institutions that we work with. Um, we have different teams, uh, data teams, venture development teams, and business teams to help our clients. Um, we spend a lot of time in designing regional innovation strategies to help move things forward. And a little bit later in this presentation, we'll walk you through some examples of that. Next slide. There's four focus areas that we're looking at in, in Memphis, Tennessee, basically leveraging our natural assets that are here. 
Uh, we're a logistics city, um, especially if you look at the presence of, of a FedEx being headquartered here. But taking advantage of our Mississippi River interstates and railroads that are here, we see um, agricultural products, distributed goods, and consumer goods coming through here all the time. And so we attract a lot of startups who are looking to side up next to some of our larger corporations that are here. At the same time, we're in the Delta region. And so we focus a lot on agriculture technology companies looking to leverage many of our partners and their farmer networks and the inroads that they have into those communities. So Rachel, to answer your question earlier, we think venture capital can be very good for rural communities if positioned the right way, working with the right mentors, working with the right farmer networks and making sure it's a win-win for all parties. So we spend a lot of time brokering and sitting in the middle there to make sure that it's advantageous to all sides. Um, at the same time, we're building a smart city here at the Union Road Development, which I'll touch on. And so we're looking for home services technology, property technology, and working with a variety of partners here as well. We can go to the next slide. We do this and create economies of scale through a variety of partners across the country um, who help us, whether they are a corporation who's looking for acquisition opportunities or R&D opportunities, whether they are tech partners um, who are providing uh, resources to our companies. Um, these are the things that we constantly um, strive for to bring these solutions and resources um, to the companies that we work with. We're members of the Global Accelerator Network um, who gives us access to quite a few programs across the world, but also deal flow for many of those programs that exist out there. Next slide. But what we noticed was we needed to meet Memphis more where it was. So our original mission going back over a decade ago was focusing on tech startups. But we noticed that a lot of folks who were walking in our doors were more representative of the population that is in Memphis. We had to understand that Memphis many times toggles with being one of the poorest communities in the country. Um, same thing when you look at coming out of recessions, um, we lead in unemployment, and there are many other disparities that, that, that are suffering here. And so we apply a lot of our best practices, technologies, and new solutions to also applying a civic model to, to the city of Memphis. Um, whether it's looking at closing the digital divide, whether it's looking at how we look at economic development and diversifying through new technologies and startups, how we engage and work with institutions, um, efforts to support black businesses, uh, poverty. We're always trying to be brokers to apply these best practices and methods to benefit the overall community and not just tech companies. Next slide. Union Row. Union Row is, is a development that's being led by a variety of partners, uh, being led by a, a few partners in particular, Kevin Adams, uh, David Dulugalinski, uh, Quincy Jones, Stuart Maxwell, and Montgomery Martin. And basically they're taking a blighted and dilapidated piece of land, which is the gateway into the downtown Memphis area and turning it into one of the largest mixed use developments um, in Memphis's history. Next slide. Overall, we're looking at um, 500 hotel keys and a couple of hotels, um, 1100 residential units, 68,000 square feet of retail, 20,000 square foot grocery store, uh, 250,000 square feet office, and 117,000 innovation building centered right there in the middle of the um, opportunity zone. The next slide. This is an image, um, you know, before demolition. Demolition took place already and we're expecting vertical construction to start towards the end of the year. But as you can see, it's entering the downtown area on the backdrop there is the Mississippi River. And so it's quite a large development, over a billion dollar um, investment being made into the Memphis community that we think will be able to push Memphis forward in a very big way. Next slide. You know, overall, Union Row has made the commitment to be more of an innovation driven mixed use development, uh, supporting the tech ecosystem, promoting health and wellness and making this a very walkable community, uh, making room for the maker movement, and also, you know, leaning into cultural capital. They didn't want to just build a development and then just walk away. They wanted to build something that had cascading returns, not just for the Union Road development, but also the neighboring communities. And we'll touch on that here in just a moment. Next slide. Smart City. Um, this is about fiber infrastructure and connectivity, um, con connecting to various devices throughout the campus 
and converging that into a data warehouse where we'll build an advanced operating system so that we can better solve problems for our public and private partners. We're hoping to build one of the most state-of-the-art um, amenities uh, that the country has ever seen for all of the tenants that are involved and for many of the partners that include the city of Memphis, um, Memphis Area Transit Authority, Memphis Light, Gas and Water, various corporate partners, and then also our university institutions like the University of Memphis. Next slide. Inclusion and diversity is something that's front and center here. It's something that we've prided ourselves at Starco and Union Row is also doing the same thing. Uh, we didn't want to just come and start new companies and invest in companies without having a diversity agenda. It's something that we pride ourselves in. So you see in terms of participation on the construction build, the investments that we're making into the companies, and then also neighboring communities that we're supporting, there's a ripple effect that we're trying to create. Next slide. And these are just a, a couple of renderings of um, coming through schematic design here. Um, we have a ballpark there, Redbird Stadium, where our soccer team and also our baseball team play. So across the street is just some renderings of how this campus will look. If we can go to the next slide, there's another one as well. Um, this is looking south from a, a street called Union Avenue, straight in the middle there towards the back is the innovation building where we're looking to house a lot of this activity. Next slide. So what did we want to do? We wanted to come together with Union Row. We were hired to become their innovation consultant and we're sitting on their development team to look at some of the Memphis challenges that we are facing. Um, we're a disconnected community, 52% um, um, having internet connectivity in the Memphis arena compared to 73% for the country. There are certain zip codes that have 82% disconnectivity in our community. We have the slowest internet in the country. We have a big education gap. Um, workforce is lagging in terms of technology opportunities. And also like other areas, there's a huge investment gap in terms of diverse participation. Next challenge. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, so we wanna leverage the opportunity zone to help lever um, you know, level the playing field here. Uh, we wanna rejuvenate an abandoned blighted neighborhood. Um, we wanna insert one of the nation's largest smart and connected communities. Um, 40 to 50% people of color and women uh, we want to invest in young companies. We want to leverage our anchor institutions to be a part of this. Um, there's a business model for sustainability that sits behind the smart city, and we want to create an on-ramp for the underserved communities. We truly think that we could build something that has global impact here. Next slide. So we built an innovation-driven economic development model called Catalyst 30. It's a $103 million investment in which Union Row is being very deliberate along with other partners and how they spend that $1 billion investment. Um, there are four core areas, build the digital city, um, technology and entrepreneurship, digital inclusion, and creating an urban campus of innovation. You know, overall, the digital city will be built um, to really support public and private partners by having an advanced operating system that they can leverage to layer on top of and solve many of the problems that they want. Technology and, and entrepreneurship is about first and foremost investments in into startups and operating businesses that are poised for growth. Um, and this is where the investors in the Union Road development will be carving out a part of their private equity that would normally go into real estate and invest into the venture world, um, focusing on those verticals that I had mentioned earlier. Digital inclusion is really focused on communities across the street. There's an area called South City, um, which is suffering from the digital divide and will be connecting households to the internet, providing coding skills, um, helping with digital literacy and creating tech um, environments that can be more conducive to their advancement. And then the urban campus of innovation. Our organization and many other entrepreneur organizations will relocate into the opportunity zone where we will spawn this activity, work with corporate partners and launch new companies. Next slide. You know, so these next couple of slides, it's, it's really about turning Union Row into this smart digital city. If you go to the next slide, it's just kind of giving a little bit of an outlay there. Um, we want everything converged and digitally connected um, from your HVAC systems to your traffic lights, to your access controls, all of this collecting data, serving as a repository and a community benefit. Next slide. Outcomes that we're expecting to see, we want to turn 30 acres into a smart city. Uh, we want to be able to connect at least 5,000 residents and businesses to stronger, more reliable internet, connect 1,000 families um, online and multiple zip codes, 
uh, build technology labs to support those youth and those families, create 2,500 jobs through technology and entrepreneurship investments, um, support 5,000 businesses, help generate 250 million in new revenue, and we want 50% placements into uh, people of color and also women. And at the 117,000 square foot innovation building, we expect to create 750 innovation jobs on site. Next slide. And this is just a running list of partners that are growing. Um, you can see there, there are a variety of governmental, um, corporate partners, um, entrepreneurial organizations, um, internet connectivity and fiber organizations as well. Next slide. So of the 103 million, 82 million in commitments right now, we're raising the balance of about $21 million in the form of grants and investments into opportunity zones. Um, 2018 and 2019, we went through an R&D phase to lay out the, the body of this work. We're currently in the design phase where we're working with a consultant called Intelligent Buildings and designing the sensor network for the smart city. Uh, vertical construction starts at the end of the year and doors will open during the winter of 2022-2023. Next slide. I think that's it. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, if you could just hang around for a little bit more because one of these questions that came up and I think it's really, really important to address and I think that uh, your presentation did a great job of doing so, so did uh, Jay's and Corb's, but how does how do these investments actually benefit those living in the opportunity zone and especially operating businesses within the opportunity zone? Um, you know, there's no mandates around community benefits agreements or um, to ensure that jobs are locally sourced. But, you know, Andre, you pointed to a number of things where the digital inclusion piece, there's a $5 million investment into surrounding communities, but then also through tech and entrepreneurship, there is a goal around 50% minority and women owned businesses and supporting jobs through that. So I don't know if you want to expand or just uh, underscore those points. I think they're really important. Sure. You know, I think it's, it's, it's kind of the work that we've been doing for the last decade, right? I mean, we realized I'd say about, you know, about 12 or so years ago that we were seeing only about 7% women participation and only about 8% or 9% people of color. We're in a 63% African-American city. And we've been able to grow that to 40 to 50% respectively in both those categories. And so I think the key is making sure that you partner with diverse partners, which bring the diverse agendas to the table. And then you be very deliberate about bringing that agenda to the investment platforms, looking at the capital stacks that are available. One of the things that Union Row has been great at doing is bringing us into the fold at the higher level decision making of how they use their capital and being very deliberate on incorporating our feedback and our advice into that strategy. This has been probably one of the first times that we've been allowed at the table for these types of investments. And so even though we're focused on the venture side, bringing the diversity side into it, them listening, you know, there's always tough conversations along the way, but it's actually panned out to be pretty nice and move things forward. Our area happens to be a blighted, dilapidated area, so there's not a lot of activity in there right now, but we hope to bring the activity to it from the local community. That's great, thank you. Corb, Jay, I don't know if you wanna weigh in on that, what you're seeing as far as the work you're doing. Sure, I mean, in the rural areas where we're um, making investments, there, there's just a lack of, of quality, resilient, high paying jobs. And, and really the overall effort here is to drive an increase of that through growing um, resilient tech businesses. So, so all of the companies that we've invested in have both hired locally and brought in talent externally, which I think is a great combination because you're, you're providing uh, you know, resources for the local community that, that wouldn't otherwise be there. And you're also introducing um, you know, great talent and, and vitality to the area, uh, you know, which is important um, for, for, for go forward um, growth. And Rachel, I take it, I, I agree with everything Andre and Jay said, and um, but I really take it from sort of the work you all have done and Keenan has done with your group and the research that we've seen. And what the research really showed to me was pre-opportunity zones, the, the issue with these census tracts and areas was lack of access to capital, right? The reason that we had, we didn't have job formation and the reason that we didn't have mm -hmm. um, 
businesses start there. And the reason that we didn't have uh, um, economic growth was access to lack of capital. The whole exercise of opportunity zones is how do we try to increase access to capital to these zones? And if we can increase access to capital to these zones, then all of the good things that Andre had and Jay had and are implicit in the question that was there, those start to occur that we get more diversity and we get all of these other sort of social benefits we want out of it, but it starts at just the, the highest level with the data showed us what we did for 30 years didn't work very well. And so we're trying to make a pivot to try to flood these zones with capital to have a different result out there. Yeah, that's great. So how do you increase access to capital? And then once you start off on that premise, making sure that you're doing so uh, with intentionality and also through partnerships. So ensuring that the right partners are at the table and representative of the communities that you're hoping to serve so that that informs your strategy. It has to be so intentional. Um, and the other thing, I'll just share an example of one of the investments that I've heard of recently. It's an investment into a business that um, has headquarters uh, throughout, or I guess uh, locations throughout the world. And um, they needed equity, needed working capital, or else they were gonna have to shut down their North American operations. And so it's a manufacturing facility. And um, the Opportunity Fund came in, they made the equity investment. And, but for that equity investment, that plant would have shot, shut down. They would have uh, offshored those jobs. They would have offshored uh, that activity. And so I think that that's another way to think about this is how opportunity funds and investors can uh, come in and ensure that jobs remain in the United States and that folks uh, can retain those jobs to avoid unemployment. Great, okay. Well, I, I wanna thank our panelists because they have been very busy answering a lot of the questions. So a lot of the stuff that we had queued up has been answered already. Um, one thing, again, Corp, I'm gonna kick it over to you first, but others, please feel free to weigh in. Um, a big question that I always get, and I know you went over it a little bit, but how can existing businesses and opportunity zones take advantage of the opportunity zone incentive in order to either expand or grow? And have you seen any interesting models where maybe um, the founder uh, sells their portion of the company into the opportunity fund, but then remains on as either um, on the board or as an employee in order to retain some ownership stake or some decision making? Um, absolutely, Rachel. So, you know, that is, as I said, probably the most often question we get. It's not the startup business. The startup business is relatively easy. It's the existing business that's there and how do we make OZs work for it? And it's really working around sort of this good asset, bad asset test. And I think as everybody who's listening to this understands is that um, EIG was successful and IRS and Treasury were successful in um, making it that we didn't have to have 100% good assets, right? That not everything had to be qualified opportunity zone business property. We only need 70% to be qualified opportunity zone business property in the regs. And that was key. That was really the key um, regulation that we got. There were so many others, but that was the key regulation that allowed all of this flexibility for us to really get in and be able to structure for any deal. So where that really can place us is that um, the existing assets of a business are going to most likely fit into that bad asset pool, that 30% pool. So what we're always looking for is how do we go and then raise the good assets that we're going and taking equity investment from OZ investors or OZ funds out there. And we're using that to increase the asset pool of the business and tip the scales over that we end up meeting the 70-30 good asset, bad asset test. Um, absolutely. Uh, Rachel, that we definitely have models and have worked through where founders stay on and, and otherwise. You need to be a little bit careful when you talked about the idea of a sale because that new OZ fund, if Jay's coming in to invest, he can't just buy the equity out from an other investor and have a good qualifying investment there. So it's really bringing in that investment 
um, to grow the business. That being said, Rachel, I do think there are ways with debt and note instruments and waiting two year periods that then a founder um, could be uh, redeemed out after two years that we can, in essence, get to the same place of what you just said. We just can't do it with an outright say, sale where Jay just comes in, invests and buys out the founder to have a good qualifying OZ investment. But as I say in all of these presentations, um, the law is flexible. And so if we have a real problem in front of us from real uh, business owners and real OZ funds, there's almost always a way to get there if everybody's willing to work for it and it makes sense um, to do an OZ transaction. And we, we've often found um, that just with a little bit of work, we can get the OZ fund and the, the current business owner on the same page and make a structure that works for all. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have about five minutes left. This is kind of a point of privilege as a presenter. Um, what sort of activities would you like to see, especially in the operating business side of Opportunity Zones, uh, scale? You know, what, what sort of best practices or models are, would you hope to see more of in the coming months and years ahead um, that you think are really impactful for communities or impactful for the um, owners of these companies? Do you guys have any ideas? I'm sure you may say they're just the models that you guys presented on. <laughs> I was really excited to hear in, in Andre's project that, that the real estate investors had carved out a portion of the equity from the project to go towards operating businesses. Because I think that that's a very important aspect to make sure that they're, you know, not only buildings, but, but places to work in those buildings and, and people to, to inhabit the, uh, the, the facilities. So, so that, that was great. We, we have not been able to um, yet find an example of that or crack that nut in, in our um, dealings. But I, I would love to be able to partner um, with some of the, the real estate capital to, to drive the operating business piece going forward. And I would just add that, um, you know, a lot of times we talk about startups and, and early stage companies, but let's face it, most of them are not going to go on to become the next, you know, whatever, but many of them become just great businesses, right? And, and so I think there's a good fit here for those who, you know, I don't wanna say that they leveled off, they're still growing, but just not maybe at the clip of what they started out on. And so we've seen companies grow from, you know, five, 10 folks to 30 folks to 80 folks to 200 folks, and they're just a good business, right? And so I think there's some real opportunity leveraging the OZ, they're not going anywhere, they're leveraging the, the, the strengths of the community so I think we're, we're looking to really, ex, you know, explore that. I really appreciated some of Corb's structures that he put up on the slides because we were thinking through some similar things. So we would love to see that as a strategy going forward. And Rachel, I guess I would say what I, what I said in the beginning is just Andre's got a great idea. Jay has tons of great ideas. I know there's other people that are listening. I know that there's others that I've participated in with the EIG network that have gone through the expense, they've created the fund, they've got the business model, they've even got the um, businesses that are there waiting for the investment. They just don't have the really large investors that are willing to do five, 10, 25, and $50 million checks into their fund that will supercharge this to the next, next, next level. And I guess that's what I'm hoping for. And if I can connect that to maybe anything that you've said, what we have seen is that check size does exist in the real estate space. And it does exist that we've got funds that are topping $500 million, right? Maybe how do we start understanding that for the good of the program as a whole, if we don't get the operating company side, we're all gonna be subject to attack and, um, uh, you know, maybe scrutiny from Congress and, it, and uh, this administration or future administrations. And so I really just would continue to try to press the investor class that the real estate side is fantastic and we need to continue to grow the real estate side. But we also just need to start having a portion of that investment going into the operating company side and really seeing um, some big success stories uh, out there so that 
that folks really start pressing more of their capital into the operating company side, not just the real estate side. Yeah, thanks, Corb. And I would double down on the need for storytelling. Uh, as you mentioned, there are a lot of activities happening uh, in the marketplace that we will never hear about because they don't get covered in uh, local news stories. But we, on that note, we actually did create a new uh, resource for folks. If you want to take a look at our website, we have a link there. In addition to our OZ activity map, we're also um, now going to be providing and switching out with some regular cadence uh, investment highlights. And right now there are a few investment highlights that look at how OZ investment is, you know, anchoring or partnering with anchor institutions or driving innovation through investments in tech firms or just supporting uh, the entrepreneurial and business ecosystem in general. So please check that out. Please tell your story if uh, you are doing some of this really great activity. Um, I've yet to see a bad headline about good activity, so don't let headline risk uh, sway you. Um, and on that, actually, uh, because you did mention Corp Investors, just want to kick this over to Andre and Jay. Um, are you guys raising money right now? Andre, I know you mentioned that you're still filling in part of the capital stack, but are you looking for additional investors? We are. Um, you know, we're looking for others to to join in in terms of investment capital. Obviously, there's there's always OZ dollars that we're looking for, and then just uh, regular limited partners through other funds that we have. So, so the answer is yes. And um, some of that also, we're looking at different incentives and grant opportunities to structurally build some of the remaining portions of the overall digital community that we're building. We do have a little bit of capacity left as, as well. All right, investors, you heard it here. <laughs> some investable opportunities into some good funds doing really great work. Um, with that, uh, I think we'll close it out. And again, please keep an eye out for uh, the recording of the webinar. We'll send that to you by email and the blog post should be up within the week. Thanks everyone for joining.